the best analogy I can give to people who don't understand is that this is dot com or the late 90s was like crypto in like 2021. Got 50 million dollars in four months to start a company. And wow. it's a very fast company that focused on you know, helping commercial general contractors get out their jobs to sub Learning is good, being humble is good, and getting more at bats is good. The Mucker story was very similar. Mucker's first fund was $1 million. My second fund was 12. And it took us three years to raise our $12 million fund. Um, my partner and I did not pay ourselves for about five years. The simplicity of, of and the purity of being an entrepreneur, that's, that's actually a pretty amazing feeling. Yes. Yeah, well, I don't want to tell you, all of a sudden they have 300 employees and oh my God, so HR problems then. Welcome to the Eight Girl Adventures podcast. Today we're thrilled to have William Shu, co-founder and managing director of Mucker Capital. With Will's deep expertise in tech and startups, we'll dive into venture capital, the secrets behind nurturing successful companies, and what the future holds for entrepreneurs and investors. Get ready for an inspiring conversation that could redefine your approach to building and investing in the next week. I'm Pamela Dazarian. Let's get started. Will, thank you so much for coming on today. It's really an honor and a pleasure to have you. Uh, we've had an opportunity of getting to know each other in in numerous circles, ironically, and it's yeah, it's got to be at least seven years, I guess, right, since we know each other, at least because I'm older. Yeah, it's it's so wonderful to have you on as a guest. I'm really excited. Of all the different companies that we have worked with, and we've worked with tons of startups, it's always surprising how active you are as an investor and how insightful you are for every founder. Because I hear the other side of the story too, right? Like when they're talking to me, so I'm really excited to well, have you. That, that's the best part of this conversation when I'm getting to the feedback from a third party. So thank you. I made my day. <laughs> of course, of course. So so for, so, so for those people who don't know about Mucker, which let's kind of help them kind of understand what Mucker Capital does. You guys are uh, at this point on fund three, right? You focus on early stage. Can you elaborate yeah. a little bit so people can understand exactly? Sure. Yep. Um, we've been around since 2011. Now we're actually on fund number six. And I know it's not your fault that you don't know, it's because we don't announce our new funds. Well, um, and that's because we started out very humbly in our early days. And now that we have a lot of momentum, we really don't think how much money we have really actually matters. Like money is not a determinant of what a good person you are and how helpful you are to an entrepreneur. So, you know, like you said, just said, right? Like it's that reference that like here, right? So whether I have 10 million or 10 billion, I don't think it actually matter. You get well, I'm here to help you as an entrepreneur. And as long as I did a good job, that's all that matters not how much money you have. Um, I love that. But it's amazing to like stay humble and stay grounded to the roots. I, I love hearing that. And it's, it's because we, those are the entrepreneurs we work with, right? We are 30% of the time, the only check into the round, um, 30% of the time, companies free revenue. So every day I'm reminded of how humble each and every company's beginning is. Because in the end, the customer is always right. If the customer doesn't write you a check, what does it matter? Nothing else matters, right? Like, doesn't matter what kind of car you drive. Doesn't matter how big a wallet is. If your customer is not writing you a check, then you're just like everyone else whose customer did not write you a check. So, right, we gotta go for, fix that problem. Go from one to ten, ten to twenty, twenty to thirty customers, right? So that's it's always everyone starts at the same place. Every entrepreneur, no matter who you are. And that's the great equalizer. And that's where I spent most of my time working with an entrepreneur at that stage. And that keeps me grounded on like, hey, the help server is always right. It doesn't matter what you've done in 2011 or 2013. Today in 2024, on this company, no one's writing us a check yet. So let's go fix that. Right. So, so obviously you've had an opportunity to work with countless founders at this stage. I mean, hundreds is probably underestimating it. and. Yeah. The more that you imagine, uh, what do you, if you look back on it, right? You're talking about the humble beginnings, getting the customer to write. What do you think if you had to really narrow it down, what are some of the characteristics that you've seen from some of the more successful founders? And for, for those of you who don't know, I mean, you, you've had some incredible, you've been early in a few incredible businesses, right? Honey, one, 
Service Titan another, and, and there's many more, I'm sure, that you guys have been one of the first that you've seen, and you're like, there's something here, let's, let's go after this. So what what are you guys looking for, and what is the common yeah. uh, key that you see? Yeah, the, the, the first thing is successful founders buy themselves time, right? And, and I, I call this number of at-bats, right? Um, nobody cares that you took you a hundred at bats to hit a home run. They only remember you hit a home run. So whether you hit it on the first at bat or second at bat, actually it doesn't matter. So as a founder, what you can control the most is to control your burn and buy yourself as much runway as you can. And the more runway you have, the more at bats you get to get it right. Whether that is another iteration on a product, or a different customer segment you want to target or a different pricing model. You just get more tries to get it right. And successful founders buy themselves months and years before they get it right. Like you just mentioned service time, our buy is a core part of the LA community here. And um, this is nothing to mucker, but for the first two years of their business, they were struggling to get the product to market. But they didn't quit. They bought themselves time. And then Mucker eventually invested. And then, you know, eight years later, it's a completely different and story. And everyone's like, it's an overnight success. No, no, this, this took a few iterations. Yeah, for two years, it was just all right, by working on the product and trying to get it right. And if they were a founder who goes, oh, we raised 100K, we ran out of money. We're now going to go get a job at McKinsey and you're going to get a job at Bain. Like, the company would have never gone to where it is today, right? But they kept at it. They bought themselves time. They kept iterating, getting more bats, and eventually they got it right. So that's number one. Number two is very much related, which is um, you got to know how to swing the bat, right? Like you got to get, once you get to the bat, you got to swing the bat, right? So swinging a bat for an entrepreneur is understanding how to iterate and how fast you can iterate, whether it's releasing a new iteration of the product, can you do that in a week rather than two, as well as testing out a, a new pricing model or testing out a new positioning or testing out a new customer segment, right? The more, the faster you can iterate, the faster you can get out there, get a feedback, even if it's a no, the more at bats you're going to have for the same amount of time. Got it. If you can have those two things, yeah, and you have good advisors, such as us, or you, to help. You know, like, I'm very confident we have a way above average than the standard startup to get it eventually right. I love that. So so what I'm hearing from you is what you've noticed is founders who are either financially prudent, they're, they're not going crazy and spending tons of capital on the wrong things, right? So they're, they're controlling the burn. They're... And then in addition to that, they are running, it might be experiments or they're talking to uh, customers or they're building really, really fast. There's a, there's a, some element of some superpower within their learning curve that they're yes. taking advantage of. And the combination of those two things in the early stage allows them to at least find a real pain point or a real problem that's not being addressed in the market. And then once that's figured out, then it's just rinse and repeat and scale. Is that a good summation? Am I... Yeah. Yeah. Like, of course you never, you know, go from zero to a hundred million in revenue yeah. like easily. Right. Like, but you buy yourself 18 to 24 months of like pure execution and then you run up against something and then you got to get back to the iteration. Mode. It's like, what is this problem? How do I solve it? How do I end? Like in my view, every company runs into it every kind of year to two years where they got to find, how do we get beyond this plateau and get to the next stage? But it's the same mentality, okay? Like if you're burning a lot of money, running out of time, like you run out of time. Right. Okay. Uh, let's let's take a little step back. We're going to come back to obviously everything that's going on, Mucker. I, I want to kind of share people a little bit about your journey, your personal path. So you, you're an immigrant from uh, Taiwan, correct? I am. I am. So I'm a very proud immigrant so far. Uh, amazing. So can you tell me a little bit of being a you know first generation or uh, immigrant coming to the US and uh, from Taiwan what 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 how has that shaped you into who you are today when you reflect back on it and what are some of the values you learned from either your from your parents that have trans transcribed here in the US cuz at least one commonality that I've seen is that there's a little difference 
perseverance. I, 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 I don't want to completely <laughs> no, no. stereotype, but, but, but there's something with immigrant children that, that is interestingly unique when it comes to entrepreneurship. And I, I'd love to hear your perspective. Yeah. Um, by definition, we're underdogs, right? And by definition, we did not belong, at least when we first landed, right? So this idea that you're underdog, and you gotta find your way to belong and find your way to not long ago be an underdog means that somewhere along your life you have to study a little harder or stay up a little longer or you know spend a little more time instead of going out to do something else for to get a better grade or you know practice your free throws a little longer because you don't never seen basketball before you landed here in the US. Like whatever it is you understood that it is required for you to go the extra mile to be successful. Nothing is given to you that you have to go and go get it yourself. It's not someone else's fault. It is not, you know, something that you can demand. Right? You came to this country, you made the choice. This is nobody's fault. And if you want to be successful, you got to walk those miles, even if it's longer than everyone else. And you accept the situation and then you just cope with it, right? And I think a lot of founders that are successful also have the same mentality. But hey, this, like, the customer is always right. And you just have to walk the extra miles to make sure it's the right product, the right pricing, the right messaging, whatever it is. There is nothing that's given to you. You can't solve that by having more money. You can't solve that by demanding the customer to buy your product, that's not a thing, right? And and complaining about it to someone else doesn't solve the problem either, right? So, um, you know, I think certainly in the early days of venture capital, I famously, uh, the Sequoia guys love my first one, it's the early generation immigrants as their prototypical prototype, right? The Jerry Yangs, the Sergeys, the Larrys, right? So, um, I think that mentality now certainly is now well known as what you need to be successful. So you certainly don't need to be a first generation or a zero generation entrepreneur to build a business. I think before it was a unique set of knowledge that we might have just because of our background, but today that's not necessarily the case. So, you know, I encourage everyone to give entrepreneurship a good try. Awesome. So, uh, at now let's go a little bit early, earlier in your career. Uh, um, can we talk a little bit about Build Point? Sure. Uh, when you were 22. So, <laughs> see, I thought my team did a really good research. <laughs> Man, Hanley, you did some research. Okay. <laughs> so um, at 22, you started Build Point, correct? Uh, if you can tell us a little bit for people who might not know what Build Point was, uh, what were some of those challenges you had as an early founder yourself, right? And and at that time, how did you go about building a business, starting a business? This is like you're right out of school at this at this point, right? So like yeah, no, I, I graduated Stanford in 1998. Uh, to give you people some context, uh, Jerry Yang started Yahoo in 1996, right? So two years after found Yahoo was founded, and right in the middle of this, Yahoo was scaling and internet was becoming a thing. Um, and, you know, uh, back in the late nineties, um, for better or for worse, maybe definitely for worse now, um, only those who are from Stanford knew what a startup was and knew how to start a company and VCs only exist in Palo Alto and therefore for better and for worse, you know, most entrepreneurs were either second or third time entrepreneurs or the first time entrepreneurs coming straight out of Stanford. Right. And for better or for worse, internet was, you know, at least the commercial internet was no more than five years old. Right. And, you know, it's not like being a 50 year old actually gives you a competitive advantage at starting an internet company versus being part of two. Um, so um, I spent straight out of Stanford, I spent 10 months in investment banking, uh, realized that what's really for me. So, uh, I was in uh, investment banking, helping startups uh, go public, internet companies go public. So I thought, hey. For I people could... who don't remember, 98, the the dot-com crash hasn't occurred. 
It hasn't occurred. It There's was... a lot of excitement online, right? They're, they're, uh, this, these are the days of uh, napkin, million dollar valuation, billion yeah. dollars. The, the best the best analogy I can give to people who don't understand is that this is this is dot com when the late nineties was like crypto in like two thousand twenty one. Wow. Like if you just put a dot com on your name, you raise money. And if you put a dot com on your name, your stock price goes up, right? And if you just announce a split of your stock and you're a dot com, the price doubles. Sounds like the Bitcoin halving to me, right? <laughs> like like Crypto is a very good analogy of what's going on back then, like dot com. People don't have uh, context. And um, I was both naive and full of myself. And I thought, hey, if everyone can start an internet company, then so can I. It doesn't seem that hard. And um, I raised about $50 million in two months to start a company, a vertical SaaS company that focused on you know, helping commercial general contractors bid out their job to subcontractors. No, I mean, interesting. Yeah, so I was in the vertical SaaS business very yeah, early. early. You well, at like that time, early, we didn't call it vertical SaaS. Yeah, yeah. We, we, the best analogy you could give to VCs uh, was we called it a uh, specialized hotmail for contractors. <laughs> it's like that was like the analogy VC understood. The only application at the time was hotmail, everything else was just like content or games, right? Like nobody actually had an application on it. And, and the only thing that felt like an application was actually Hotmail. Right. And, and, and you know, some, some listeners might not even know what Hotmail is, but it's the <laughs> very first uh, web-based uh, email client. Because before that, and I remember there's some Stanford, you use Pine or Elm on Telnet. Okay. I remember Telnet. I remember <laughs> Telnet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, uh, I was very naive, um, and for sure, looking back, I was completely unready to start an internet company. Um, uh, or it's just starting a company. Um, we, we raised a lot of money because we knew how to raise money and because we're from Stanford, but not necessarily because we're great entrepreneurs. Um, and in the world of the blind, the one I man is king, came from Jeff Bezos, and uh, I was, you know, probably blind in both sides, right? So raise a lot of money, build a product, I don't know. Hired about a hundred salespeople to sell our product, which we gave away for free. Wow. Think of uh, Union Economics. We were just losing money to get users, and we didn't care because we didn't know there was a difference between SaaS and content business when we're just trying to collect type box. Um, we were very good at getting adoption, but terrible at really understanding how to monetize our product. And with the market crash in 2001, the free money dried up, you know, like your, and your ape NFTs went from 10,000 to 50 bucks. And what do you do? And I really didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to make money from my companies. And my VC smartly uh, fired me uh, and hired a bunch of executives from Morocco to kind of turn around the business. Um, and the company was actually eventually sold. Um, even though I didn't end up making any money on it, there was still a uh, a good outcome from the moral victory perspective. Right. And then did it you, also taught me to... Do you think some of, the, some of the fundamentals that you look for in founders now came from this experience? Like, uh... Absolutely. Um, I like to tell people that I don't... We, we here at Mucker don't invest in well 22-year-old wells. Right? Right. Just because you're from Stanford, just because you have an engineering degree... Just because you know how to put a couple of servers together doesn't mean that you can actually go out a great business. The optics of who you are is not what's important. What's important is that do you know how to walk the walk and talk the talk? And if you can do that, I don't care where you go to school. I don't care where you're from. I don't care, you know, like like who your best friends are and whether you baby sat for sleep jobs or not. None of that matters. Um, and what can we invest in people? We don't invest in, 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 in a resume, yeah. if you want. And back to the immigrant roots, right? like we like people who are underdogs. Uh, a lot of people who think they know how to do something just because who they are. Um, so it has shaped a lot um, how easy it is to get caught up in the hype, how easy it is to think you're doing the right thing despite all the spider senses telling you not to. 
just because you think, oh, I was the true north that we're going to look at. Oh. Amazing. So uh, now let's transition a little bit more into your career. Uh, obviously, from BuildPoint, then you, from there you ended up going and working at eBay, right? Uh, what, where, where is eBay at this stage? And you come in as a product manager. T tell me what are some of the interesting things you learned? Uh, it, I mean, yeah. eBay is young, right, at, at this point? Yeah. Um, you know, every crash... Um, actually creates winners, right? And the winners become outsized winners. 99% uh, of the company goes away, but 1% that survive, they become rock stars. And eBay was one of those companies that survived the dot-com crash coming out as one of the big winners. Um, doesn't seem like it today, but in 2004, 2005, when I joined the company, eBay was three times larger than Amazon. Um, and it was one of the few internet companies that I was actually hiring because there were very few of them that actually survived the crash. And, um, you know, obviously after business school, so I went to business school from 2003 to 2005, um, I could have come back on the horse and say, oh, it's not a company yet. But I knew I wasn't quite ready. And I really need to learn how to manage a product, manage a business, and really get my hands dirty as an operator for a very long time. So I sucked it up and, you know, put in my resume and applied for a job at eBay as a associate product manager making $35,000 a year. Amazing. Um, yeah, I think most of my peers, I was already 30 at the time, most of my peers were like 23, a couple of years out of an investment banking, banking firm or a year out of Stanford. Uh, but, you know, it's not about the title, it's about what I stopped to learn. And, you know, honestly, eBay was the best issues I may make because, uh, um, my boss at eBay, the guy that gave me job, my chance to actually have a real career, um, is my current partner, Eric. So that's how we met. And I built enough trust with him while working for him that, um, we, we got together in 2000 and stuff, much more together. Right. Eric is not that much older than you, right? Uh, I mean, no, 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 I mean, like, that's, that's why like, I, I took a super level junior level job, yeah. uh, not like not caring how much you get paid, not caring what I don't want. I just wanted to do work. And right. I think I can recognize that like, I was kind of ego free and not that focused on title. Like I learned I sent in the dot com crash that, you know, I can actually be coached. So here That's I am. Amazing. So, so it sounds like part of what has been transformational for you is staying humble, doing from the doing, not letting that destroy you per se, right? Like for some people, man, uh, Bill Point could have been like, oh my God, I, I just, I'm done. Like <laughs> that, uh -huh. that knockout punch. But for you, that that you took that and you learned from that experience, right? In addition to that, you went back to school and then you came back out and you said, okay, maybe I'm not ready yet, but there's st still stuff I need to learn. Still staying humble, still staying to your roots. You went to eBay and you started learning the skills that were maybe lacking for you while you were trying to build build point or some iterations of that and, and kind of started going through that cycle. Absolutely. Get it, get it in an environment, in a culture where you could do it because you, you saw a startup that was successful at the time, it was growing and it was a great environment to be uh, surrounded by peers. Is is that a pretty good summation? Yeah. Uh, yep. Yep. You can say it better than I do. You know, I, I always tell people that you have to invest in your career, especially when you're young and early rather than think about what my title is and how much I'm getting paid. And I can network with anybody, the people I don't trust with, they they have been incredible and val invaluable and critical to my the, the entire market journey. Right. So um no don't don't get caught up on that kind of stuff too early. Right. Learning is good. Being humble is good and getting more at bats is good. That's amazing. And then from here, then you transition to a, a traditional, much larger organization. <laughs> so you went from a fast, nimble company like eBay to AT&T, right? So, so you, tell me a little bit about that. So, so you, here you are, you, you're, you've been in the startup world. You, you've been, you, you've been, you've been a founder, you've worked with a startup that moves fast. And now we're going to AT&T. It's an interesting transition. Uh -huh. Help me understand this a little bit. Yeah, uh, it, it wasn't 
It wasn't random. It was by choice. Um, okay. I knew that to be a great founder, you can't just go build a company zero to one or one to two, two to three. You have to build it all the way to 10. And I certainly don't want to be the type of founder who gets, you know, pushed out or leaves after three, four, five years at the company. And I wanted to be the type of founder that can scale as the company grows and really be a value add and, and you know, even maintain the founder CEO type over a long time, right? Like, you know, the Dells, the Gates, right? the chambers of the world, right? So, um, one way to experience what's it like to be at a big company and build a, and manage a large company is to go to one. And at and gave me that experience of managing a very big p and lots of people and our whole kind of portfolio of products and, and a complication of kind of company politics. You know, you're, 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 and you're one of the executive and not the captain of an aircraft carrier. How do you how do you impact change? How do you kind of accelerate direction? And how you be strategic? Because as a speedboat, it's totally fine. It's exactly a way to success. But as an aircraft carrier, you really need to know where you're going. Because changing direction is hard, right? But you have a lot of competitive advantage as an aircraft carrier because. When you decide you have a lot of firepower and I want to really experience what it means to have that kind of firepower. I love that. I love that analogy. Aircraft carrying area versus a speedboat. And so, yeah. and, and so you got this experience. Now you have both sides of the equation. This, you're at this stage. How old is your 30s? Is that? or uh, I was in my late 30s. So like 30s. Six thirty-seven, something like that. Yeah. So uh, it sounds like what I've heard so far in your story, it, it's all been around, you know, getting that one up bat again, right? Go, going back and being a founder. But <laughs> what changed? Like, when, when did you say, okay, no, I actually don't want to be a founder. I actually want to be a VC. Where did that, <laughs> that come from? Yeah. Um, I spent almost 15 years getting ready to be a founder on Jet. And the plan was leave at and and start my own company, or well, probably a SaaS company. Um, and that was the master plan. Been working on it for a long time. And when I finally thought I was ready, uh, Eric came and ruined it all. Um, so, upon Eric, um, for four years I was at at and he spent at uh, a seat on Co Harrison Metal. Also founded by the money bay executives, but actually um, my boss's boss's boss. So also someone that I, I, I reported to at, at eBay. And Harrison Meadow was one of the first seed funds in the Bay Area and one of the most successful seed funds ever in the history of seed funds. And Eric kind of saw the future that this is the new model and investing that entrepreneurs want a small check from an investor who's going to invest a lot of time working with them to build their business, not a big check from a big fund. They'll want that later, but the first check they're going to value both both of money. And he knew that this will not just stay contained in the Bay Area and it will become, you know, a nationwide, if not a global trend of seed funds focusing on helping entrepreneurs at their very stages and then creating a very accessible path for entrepreneurs to go from an idea to first part of the first revenue and that anyone can do it, not just kids from STEM. And I was seduced by that vision. And even more importantly, which is my rebuttal to you, is uh, Mucker is also a startup. It is my second startup. Because before me and Eric, there was no mucker, and we certainly had the founders of the firm. And we have built the firm like a company since the early days of the day. It is somewhat of a brand, if I may be a little less humble. Um, and certainly, uh, 
you know, I don't get as much joy as, as building a company and have lots of revenue. That certainly is the biggest thrill in the world, right? Building revenue, building businesses, having lots of people working for the company. Um, but I get some of that through the entrepreneurs I help, right? Like I get immense proud, you know, driving by brand on Glendale and seeing that similar type of sign on there. Okay. And I've never been the type to need to get famous or get on TV. So just having a satisfaction is good enough for me. So, um, Tara Mucker is a startup and I also get a piece of that when I'm from kind of well, working with my entrepreneurs. Yeah, let's talk about that because uh, now we're back to Mukner. So for everyone, right, we're back at today's time. I don't even, I've lost track how many founders that we've overlapped with accidentally sometimes even, right? Every single one that works with you talks about what the thing that they look forward to is if they get 30 minutes with you, they are so, so happy because that gives them that insight. That, that insight that they weren't thinking about, that thing that, that, that maybe they didn't see and you help guide them through that component of it. How do you do that? Uh, like, like, let's just look, think about that for a second, right? I, I'm sure they're not the only founder. I, I'm sure if I looked at your calendar today, uh, I was lucky enough to get an hour. So thank you so <laughs> much by that way. But for, I, I, I'm guessing, this is just me, no, you know, Probably you've had six of these already today, if not eight of these, and founder conversations, right? Yeah. So you need to keep track of not only where they're at, where they're going, what, what industry they're in, what they're struggling with, their go-to-market strategy, their team structure, all of this to be, because, you know, you can't give solid advice unless you know all of those things, right? Yeah. And, and that was like, so walk me through that part of what, why do does every founder just cherish those 30 minutes. Wow. And what do you think makes you so poignant in being able to see something that they might not be able to see and being able to bring it to their attention? Sure. Um, my mornings uh, are filled with my founder meetings in a half hour chunks. So by between 8.30 to 12.30, um, I'm on founder meetings at 30 minute chunks. So six to eight per day. Um, you do the math. I was totally guessing, by the way. So yeah, like... <laughs> yeah. It's like you do the math, uh, and it is the best part of my day, actually, uh, because I'm a natural problem solver and I love solving puzzles. Uh, I'm a math geek, so for me, it's like solving an equation. And um, I don't know if it's like a natural skill or not, but like I like juggling a lot of things, right? And uh, I just remember what I'm working with because we typically work with our founders for about a year, if not as long as three sometimes on this kind of weekly cadence. And when you talk to someone about their business every week, like six week in, seven week in, like you build a over quarter relationship. And that's why they talk about me a lot. Like they literally see me every week. They might now talk to me more than they talk to their parents, right? <laughs> uh, and, and you know, like a year in, like we all remember how we got started and how we got here. So it becomes a nat second, kind of second nature discussion. Um, the thing I'll say is that it's it's not because Will is smarter than anyone else. Um, it's because I have so many of these conversations with entrepreneurs that I can pattern match the problems much easier. Right. I have, I'm, a, I'm a, a large language model with a lot more inputs than another large language model to speak because I do have eight meetings a day. Right. Right. And I can kind of pattern match these problems. And then I also see a lot of solutions that entrepreneurs come up with, lots of them super ingenious for the problem they're solving. So I can go up and go, Hamlet, have you tried A, B, and C? Because, you know, Joe over there just tried it. Oh my God, it worked so well. Right. Right. I'm just routing information back and forth and doing a little bit tweaking, maybe like an out large, large language model. I'm actually not that smart. Like large language models are not creating stuff out of thin air. It just kind of like some sort of heuristic that's pattern match problems and solution or like try A, try B, try C, right? So uh, I do a lot of that. Um, and then the second thing is 
Um, a certain amount of healthy distance helps me understand and prioritize. We have 30 minutes. We can only talk about three or four of the major problems that you're, for, you're facing so I can be productive for you. I haven't been involved with you for the seven days prior, so I don't get in the weeds. So I can bring the entrepreneur back up and say, okay, I know we saw, tried to solve that problem last week, what happened? Like, I know you ran into four more problems during the week and you might have gotten off track, but let's go back to that initial problem because we know that's the number one argument for us. I love that. So the, fo the focus on the problem at hand and not letting the fire of the week distract the real core problem help with the weekly cadence helps with that, right? And, yeah. Uh, yeah, I love that. And, and and so let's go back to the large language model. I love that analogy, by the way. So so it's kind of similar for us as an agency, right? So for us as an agency, we get different strategies. And the way we look at it, and at least the way we ex explain it, is we look at it as concurrent experiments running across multiple different companies with different tactics or strategies. And when we notice some experiment working, we pull that and say, how does it apply in this category or how does it apply in this industry and so on. And it sounds like you're doing something similar behind the scenes. Yeah. You're, you're kind yeah. of seeing what's yeah. the best of and trying to connect the dots and say, would it work here or would it work here? Right? Yeah, I mean, we're VCs look like our business model is to give people money and get money back and, and you know, after 10 years. But what we do every day is services. We provide a service to our entrepreneurs. I love that. Uh, so we've obviously now we're in the midst of mucker and we're 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 talking about all the exciting the day to day stuff. Uh, where what is the biggest challenge? So these are for the VCs that are lis listening in, right? So what are some of the bigger challenges you guys had to overcome as an early stage VC? When, when you were in the beginning trying to convince LPs to even believe in you guys. Uh, I'm sure there was a moment of that. If you can reflect back on that, because, you know, I'm a new emerging fund manager. I, I, I want I want to convince LPs. I'm in constant meetings. They're like, you don't have a track record. You, you, you know, we, you would be, you burn through 50 million. <laughs> like, what? Why am I going to put money in? All of those things. How did you guys overcome those days? If you could reflect back on that. Um, I give uh, GPs who are entrepreneurs. I, uh, uh, VCs are starting the own firm. The same advice that we give to entrepreneurs, which is you got to look at your pool of capital as one way. And you need to buy yourself time until you find product market fit. And what a market fit for VCs to define anywhere from having an exit, which is obviously great and returning money to LPs, to like getting Sequoia to invest in your first in your first company out of your portfolio, or anything that shows that you know how to find a great entrepreneur, you know how to help them build a great business, and you know how to help them raise the next round of money. The market story was very similar. Mucker's first fund was $1 million. Our second fund was 12. And it took us three years to raise our $12 million fund. Um, my partner and I did not pay ourselves for about five years. Amazing. Right? So, like, we refused to die. We could have gone to the job and, you know, left Mucker and all that good stuff, but we refused to die. We just kept getting ourselves at bat, even though we ran out of runway. Right. Convince me. You, you do have a startup in market. I, I'm sold. I'm convinced. <laughs> <laughs> you know it's a startup when you're eating ramen and you're not paying yourself. Then you know it's a startup, right? Yeah, so. like yeah, you can't say I'm going to raise $500,000 and half of it is going to go to my me and my founder's salary. That is not a startup. Right. Right? That is like a company job. Well, you should be like, I'm set $500,000. Me and my founders are not paying ourselves. Half of that is going to engineers because building product is important. And then the other half is going to spend go to market because I need to test out the product market fit. And then when there's product market fit, I'm going to like raise money for VCs and pay myself because then I feel good about paying myself. I know I can return capital for my, for my investors. Right. Like you, you, you're not sleeping badly thinking, oh my God, like, I just took someone else's money and then nothing's going to happen and they're going to get nothing. I hate that feeling. It's so, probably one of the most hardest stresses for founders, right? Like early stage founders is the 
the burden of responsibility could be too heavy that it might even actually cripple their capabilities of running the experiment or taking the risk. So being able to deflate that out of the equation, keep giving them a clear headed mind and not being able to do that. Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, like, you know, the, the, the hierarchy of needs, right? Like, right. like if all you can do is feed yourself because you're hungry, then let's go feed ourselves. Let's not worry about anything else. And keeping your life so simple, which is, let's just get to the bottom of it. First customer, pay X dollars. Second customer, pay Y dollars. How many can we get, right? Like, the simplicity of, of and the purity of being an entrepreneur, that's, that's actually a pretty amazing feeling because, you know, well, I don't want to tell you, all of a sudden they have 300 employees and, oh my God, it's all HR problems then. Right. Sc- scaling always has a new set of problems. Yeah. No, no, no. So, so let's take one. Uh, I know I know we, we got into this. I, I want to, and I really want to get into this with you because this is one of my things I, I'm, I'm dying to find out from you is you guys have invested in a lot of great companies. You get early on, you, you've seen the go to market and you've seen different technological technology ways now, right? So th- this is nothing different for you. You've been at it for a while. We're, we're what decade plus change or so you've been at it. When you look at your portfolio companies now, and I'm not going to ask you to pick the most beautiful child. I'm not going to do that. Well, I hate right? that question. I'm not going to do that because I'm sure they're all listening. They're like, Why did you pick me? I'm not going to put that in situation on you. But when you when you look back at it and you look at your your investment portfolio, what are categories as a whole when you look at that you are bullish on in the next coming, let's say three years or five years or seven years that you feel are underrepresented and mm-hmm. you feel that there are genuine opportunities in the marketplace that if, if people if people were building a startup, is this some some area that they should be thinking about or a category that people seem to not be looking at? Um, I think everybody's talking about generative AI, but I have a very specific viewpoint, which is, I do believe generative AI will change the world. However, I don't think a lot of VCs will actually make money. Check. And that's because in the end, you're an application. In the end, you are a SaaS company. In the end, you are an e-commerce company. In the end, you are a marketplace. Right now, you, you still have to find a business model, and you have to pick a business model and become that business model. It doesn't matter what tools you do or you get to that product to become that business model. You still have to be. You are a, you leverage an AI to build a marketplace. Like great marketplaces have great velocity and liquidity and frequency of usage. If you use Genai to build a cloud SaaS application company, you still need to worry about your net dollar retention, your churn rate, or your ACV, right? And your CAC. So like the fundamental of the business hasn't changed. Gen AI is not a business model of innovation. So you still have to block and tackle, right? The biggest mistake in the dot-com world was like people thought, the internet changed everything. So because it changed everything, we don't have to make money. Money doesn't matter because we can get eyeballs. Well, 2001 showed us like eyeball doesn't equal cool money, right? And we shouldn't think of the world that way. Look, the tools that we use to create disruption doesn't, doesn't absolve us the responsibility of finding a business model and you know, we still have to find a business model. Uh, and then to the end, um, and Mucker, I still care about the businesses that was interesting three years ago, five years ago. A lot of VC don't anymore. They want to do chat. Right? I still care about marketplaces. I care about vertical SaaS company. I care about uh, a consumer application. I care about a game. And then I would care about the fundamentals of that business, the metrics that's generating, whether that is the usage and retention on the user side or it's more accounting and financial based. Right. So, um, Mucker is pretending the world hasn't changed since 2019. We will focus on the fundamentals and keep doing the same thing. We're not the firm to go chase one trend or another. I've learned my lesson. Like the trends come and go, and you should leverage them for disruption. But in the end, you got to figure out your business model, build a great company, and have a great PL. 
And we want our companies to do that, and we want to find companies to do that, regardless of what's hard and what's good. Amazing. And let's wrap it up with that. I mean, thank you, Will, for taking the time today. It's been an incredibly wonderful uh, journey that you've shared with us from your from your beginnings, from immigrating from Taiwan and staying humble and all the lessons you've learned along the way. But founders listening in, you, you heard it straight here. It, it's don't be chasing trends. Focus on building businesses that are fundamentally, at the end of the day, customer is going to show you that it's right and, and stay focused on that. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Will, if people want to get a hold of you, what's the best way? Is what's the yeah, uh, I love cold emails. So, oh, email. William, oh, uh, yeah, you know, the creative nature of people. <laughs> yeah, so William at Mucker.com. Uh, you heard that, William at Mucker.com. Feel free to feel to email him, but please don't make it a generic one. Make, make it interesting, make, 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 it, make it relevant. Uh, yeah, it can't be just yo, what's up, you know, <laughs> then I'll just write back, yo, what's up, and that's not very productive for your date either. But I went back, yo, what's up. <laughs> That's too funny. Well, thanks again uh, for joining us today, Will. It's been a really, it's been an honor, a pleasure. Thanks for everyone for listening in. Make sure you subscribe. This is Hamlet Azarian. Until next time, keep venturing forward and breaking new ground. <laughs>